Today, I'm going to show you the duodenum from 1970 onward. The duodenum was once considered the thinking man's uh, organ. The duodenum was recognized as a unique organ when barium was king because more diagnoses were noted to occur or were apparent in the duodenum than in any other segment of the gut. 1970, the, it was called the thinking radiologist organ. In 2020, you need to know it, but there's less need to think, because if there's any problem, it's usually found with CT first. But barium does remain a test that can be ordered, water-soluble, a test that can be ordered, or you can see the duodenum in a test that you have to take. So let's go through the unique duodenum. Water-soluble, or barium, show mucosal detail that CT cannot. Endoscopy can, but it's invasive. There will be uses for barium and water-soluble contrast exams, and you'll need to know in practice or in board examinations. What follows are classic illustrations of duodenal diseases or normal variants. And not just one picture, but several, so that you'll understand the variation in appearance, the severity of a particular process. The duodenum is unique embryologically because it gives rise to the biliary tree, the pancreas, and the pancreatic duct. Diseases in these organs will be seen in the duodenum. The anatomy straddles the intra- and retroperitoneum. So it is, in a way, every organ's neighbor in the upper abdomen. The physiology is dramatic because it goes from acid to base rapidly. It's also been called hormone central, hormone central of the gut, because there are a lot of neuroendocrine organs and sensors that will send out signals to other areas of the bowel or to the brain based on the content and the pH within the duodenum. We used to examine it with 0.1 milligram of glucagon from 1978 to 2006, and it gave us exquisite detail. It was stopped because of expense and because of the rarity of the number of upper GI series. We went from 20 in a morning to just one or two every other day. This is the pylorus that you can see well, and this is the stomach before the duodenum, the duodenal bulb, the descending limb of the duodenum. And this is the major papilla. And this is uh, the major papilla in multiple obliquities so that you can see the different appearance that is there anatomically. Cannot be seen by any other imaging modality. There's the minor papilla in two patients up above the major papilla. So this is the major papilla, and this is the minor papilla above it. Now here is an example of a finding which you may be shown or you may see in practice. And this is an example of air filling the duodenal bulb. And that circle is disease. What is that? There are two findings in this case. But we're going to concentrate on the circle for a moment. There's another finding there. The circle was showing heterotopic mucosa in the duodenal bulb. And this is variable in the number of mucosal nodules that are seen. It tends to occur in the base. And these tend to be polygonal, tri uh, uh, polygons, triangles, semicircles. They tend to become minimum toward the apex of the duodenal bulb. Another example, sometimes it appears as if they flow down the duodenal bulb. This, There are more of them here than you see because this is some barium streaming down and highlighting it. But up in here will be a few other smaller ones that would be seen. This is heterotopic mucosa in two patients. Not many here and more in the others I've shown. And these produce gastrin. And over years, surgeons have learned the hard way that they had to resect the base of the duodenal bulb whenever they did any gastroduodenal surgery. 
If they left it in, then the patient would have unopposed gastrin production and would result in a marginal ulceration. So that second finding, we've seen the one finding. What is that second finding? That second finding is a pseudopolyp or a pseudo-ulcer that is seen in a unique location in the duodenum. It may be seen in other GI organs, but this is the only one that takes a hairpin turn because the bulb is intraperitoneal and the descending limb is retroperitoneal and they can bend acutely and create a hairpin turn that creates a pseudopolyp or a pseudo-ulcer in here, in here. Another patient. This has been called the flexure pseudopolyp at the junction of the bulb. Uh, the bulb is flexible, the duodenum is fixed in the retroperitoneum, and it will produce some dramatic question marks that in the past, way past, led to endoscopies or follow-up examinations to check for healing. Another example of a large polypoid filling defect that might be mistaken as disease, but we know it's right at the flexure. This is another finding that you can see in the base of the duodenal bulb, and this is invagination into the base. And it's often secondary to gastritis, where the pylorus and the antrum are stiffer and thicker, and they tend to push into the flaccid duodenal bulb. Several examples. This is a classic in radiology of the duodenum, and here are multiple relatively uniform-sized polyps in the duodenal bulb, and they tend to fade out or disappear in the descending limb. Usually after the, the major papilla, there are very few that are found. And this is called Brunner's gland hyperplasia. These are submucosal glands. They're in, in the superficial submucosa. And in some patients, they project deeply into the lumen. The reason why some people show them and others have fewer is not yet understood. Here's a Example of an MRI showing T2 bright fluid in the submucosa. And this is Brunner's gland hyperplasia in the descending limb of the duodenum. Occasionally, they can become one or, or several can become extremely big. And they are called Brunner's gland hematomas or adenomas. You leave them alone unless they become big and you can define them prolapsing into the duodenum with the base of attachment up high. This one attaches way up here and is deforming the duodenum all the way down. Base of bulb uh, may, uh, is up here, and then all of that goes way down into the descending limb beyond the papilla. This is a case from the World Journal of Gastroenterology, also showing a giant Brunner's gland hematoma in the distal duodenum. This is prolapsed down and is pulling the duodenum and, and, and intersuscepting into the duodenum. Here is a question mark for you. The patient on the left is uh, a patient with an abnormality and the same with the patient on the right. Both of these patients have the same disease process. And on the left, it's invisible. On the right, you suspect that there might be something very funky because these are long folds rather than transverse folds. And here are three patients that both have the same finding. They have a leftover puddle of relatively dense barium, a puddle and a puddle in the descending limb of the duodenum. And this may be the only thing that you pick up on a GI series, uh, unless you look carefully fluoroscope, palpate, and are aware of it. This is called an intraluminal duodenal diverticulum, which is a congenital incomplete diaphragm across the upper portion of the duodenum. If it is complete, then the patient has duodenal atresia and will vomit as a baby and be discovered and operated on. But if there is an incomplete diaphragm, milk can get through and the baby may grow to adulthood. It occurs in the descending duodenum, and it is noted to be above the major papilla and below the minor papilla. Enteric symptoms predominate, and this tends to fill with barium or fluid, and it may retain ingested coins or other things that the patient may have ingested during an entire lifetime. It's also been called the windsock of the duodenum because it may balloon and deflate during the examination, just like a windsock can collapse when there's no 
air, when there's no fluid or barium squeezed into it, it may collapse in the duodenum, as I showed on the initial images. Endoscopic incision, when found, this lesion can be cured by simple endoscopy and cutting the apex of it. It's relatively avascular at the apex, cut away and you'll do fine. So this may inflate and deflate. This is one patient, subtle, almost invisible except for a little puddle here, and then finally a, a gust of barium or a bolus of barium passes into it, filling it out, and definitely now you know it's abnormal. Another patient blowing up. These uh, sometimes will show their origin. This is where it is an incomplete diaphragm and then it balloons or deflates depending upon peristalsis. Another one. Notice how large it is, and this one is going toward the ligament of trites all the way out to the edge. And another patient with an intraluminal duodenal diverticulum, and this one is intersuscepting and compacting the duodenal folds as it goes all the way out into the proximal jejunum beyond the ligament of trites. And look at that, going down into the descending limb of the duodenum. Now, what is this finding? This is a patient who has a filling defect in the descending limb of the duodenum. And it's pliable. The peristalsis passes through it. It changes a little bit. This is called a colodococcele, cystic dilatation of the ampulla ovata that projects or protrudes into the duodenum. A small or a large amount of it may protrude into the duodenum and get bigger and bigger over time. Here is a T-tube cholangiogram from yesteryear showing how it distends and almost projects fully into the lumen. These can be small, medium, large, and even humongous. It's a filling defect on an upper GI series, but it will fill during any form of cholangiography. On MRI, it will be T too bright because it's filled with bile fluid. And this may have biliary, enteric, or pancreatic obstructive symptoms. And in the old days, before CT, it would be a puzzling finding, and deaths have been reported in the past due to this, due to pancreatitis, once in a while toward biliary uh, uh, cholangitis, ascending cholangitis. So another example for you to see the variation, another one by... Uh, by MRCP as a little puddle ballooning out of the distal common bile duct into the duodenum. Another yet, and this one is beginning to get long, and peristalsis will grab it and will make it longer and larger, longer and larger, and it may go all the way down into the distal duodenum or jejunum even. Another one, long and far and wide. Now, this is a CT scan showing a, a fluid structure in the duodenum. And it's right in the right place, in the right location. You can follow it up right to the papilla. And this is the appearance with CT scan. It will be fluid density, the same density as adjacent gallbladder bile. This is a question mark, and I'm going to ask you to look carefully at the pancreatic duct because there's an X there, because the ducts are crossing. Uh, this is the uh, pancreat main pancreatic duct, but it's not going down and joining the common bile duct uh, at the ampulla. It's going out into the lesser, the lesser papilla. This X is a sign of pancreatic divisum. And because the pancreatic duct supplies that tiny little um, Santorini duct at the minor papilla, that's a lot of volume. And over time, this may develop into a Santorini seal, a bulbous dilatation projecting into the duodenal lumen, as you can see here, and bulging into the duodenum here. This is another question mark. This is a patient who went through a liver transplant and I called the surgeon on the post-operative cholangiogram and said, no problems with your liver uh, and your anastomosis, but did you notice something funny about the, the pancreas? Because this is 
the pancreatic duct going to the right and circling around the duodenum. And he said, yeah, there was some tissue there. This is an annular pancreas going all the way around the duodenum. Now, the pancreas forms off of the embryologic duodenum. And there's a dorsal and ventral pancreas. They are supposed to come together like this, where the main body of the pancreas inserts into initially into the, the lesser papilla. But with time, it uh, joins and it empties its major volume into the major papilla. That's normal in an adult. This is an annular pancreas where the pancreas doesn't fuse completely and encircles the duodenum. Now, we used to see this often um, with a notch on the side. Here's another patient who had an ERC, had an upper GI series, but uh, we can see that the pancreatic duct is going around. Uh, this patient had an ERCP first, and then we gave barium to see it a little bit better. This is another patient who has a notch in the descending limb of the duodenum. We would see these frequently. There would be a number of reasons for this. Annular pancreas was common, but we also saw that there were other uh, diseases that would produce this. Here is an annular pancreas on CT, and we see contrast by mouth, and there's this soft tissue all the way around the duodenum. Now, what can that be? Well, uh, the red represents the lumen, and the green is the pancre pancreatic tissue that is going around it. We look here, and this is a, a CT scan on a patient with fatty involution. And there is a lot of fat in the pancreas, and then there's cl a cloudy duodenum with pancreatic tissue that's going around the duodenum. So this is another annular pancreas. Another annular pancreas with the claw or the, the pancreas having a, like a mouth of, a, of, a, of an animal. And uh, in it is the duodenum. Sometimes there's a lot of pancreatic tissue and sometimes it's just a thread-like uh, annular pancreas, as this case is, not quite as bulky. There's a differential for the notched descending duodenum, annular pancreas, post bulbar ulcer, post optoodenotomy. In the old days of surgery before ERCP, they would do a sphincterotomy by doing a coker maneuver, lifting up the duodenum, cutting the lateral wall, and going in and doing a sphincterotomy. So we saw many of these in the old days. Now it tends to be annular pancreas, once in a while post bulbar ulcer, or Crohn's disease can scar the duodenum. And then LADS bands, when there is a malrotation and the duodenum uh, um, is in the way. The, the, the colon has uh, colonic bands that go up to the liver normally. And when there is malrotation, these are stretched over the duodenum, and they will cause an impression on the duodenum. Rare, but it does occur. Also, there's a preduodenal portal vein, another rare, super rare anomaly with, occurring with malrotation and a right paraduodenal hernia. Ectopic pancreas. There are two types of ectopic pancreas which can manifest in the duodenum or in the stomach, and one of them is a pancreatic rest. And the pancreatic rest, most of them tend to occur within the stomach and the greater curvature. The other form is a rotation anomaly where the um, pancreas does not form a normal uncinate, and these tend to have a weak or absent uncinate, and most of the uncinate is behind the stomach, causing a filling defect or distortion of the duodenum, depending upon the size, or on the duodenal, uh, on the antrum of the stomach. So this is a rotation anomaly, and in it you can see that there's a duct, and that is the duct that would go to the uncinate, which has not flipped around in this congenital anomaly. Another patient here who has a strange appearance of the duodenum. This is the duodenum, but all around it is low-density soft tissue. The pancreas itself, from what we see, is relatively normal. But on the coronals, there is extra fluid that is associated with the wall of 
the duodenum, both near the pancreas and on the opposite wall. This is a, a not completely uncommon. This, is, this, this does occur and is seen. Here is a patient who has a fluid collection that is communicating, oh, arising from the descending limb of the duodenum and following the wall and the lumen of the duodenum along to the ligament of trites. There's some fold thickening in here. And this is an anomaly that has been called communicating intramural duodenal pseudocyst, which is rare for it to communicate. But this occurs in an entity called cystic dystrophy of the duodenum, also known as groove pancreatitis. Sometimes this process can manifest as duodenal abnormality, or it can present as pancreatitis in the groove between the duodenum and the adjacent pancreas. These two names ar arose because two different sets of investigators were investigating the process from different points of view and writing them up with different names. This is a pre-op liver donor, 28-year-old patient who's asymptomatic and went in for liver parcellation. And you can see that the duodenum really looks funny with fluid all the way around the duodenum as discrete or confluent cysts. This patient had no symptoms, had no further workup because he was asymptomatic and was turned down for liver transplantation as a donor. But the only thing that I think this can be is cystic dystrophy of the duodenum. Uh, this patient has no pancreatitis at this time and is going to be left alone. This is groove pancreatitis. Synonym uh, is uh, cystic dystrophy. And inflammation of the groove between the duodenum and the pancreas occurs. The theory is congenital anomaly of pancreatic ectopic tissue in the duodenal wall occurs, and that's prone in some patients to pancreatitis, limited to the groove region. It may only show duodenitis, or it may show fluid in the head of the pancreas, around the head of the pancreas, and along the, the adjacent immediate duodenum. Another patient with groove pancreatitis, and you look here, this is the duodenum, and beside it is a little bit of fat edema and a little bit of fluid between the duodenum and the head of the pancreas, groove pancreatitis, also known as cystic dystrophy of the duodenum, or related to it. Another patient with groove pancreatitis, and there is edema and fluid around the posterior portion of the duodenum and between the duodenum and the adjacent pancreas. The body of the pancreas is normal. And um, there's a little tiny minor early pseudocyst forming here from that groove pancreatitis. So that little bit of ectopic tissue can produce all of the features that the, the pancreatitis could, uh, would, would show in the rest of the pancreas, but it's limited to that one area, groove pancreatitis. This is a post bulbar ulcer. And we used to see these very commonly in the day before there was acid suppression therapy and there was lots of barium being thrown around. And we knew that we would see a scar that forms. And the scar that forms as this post bulbar ulcer heals will retract toward the pancreas because this side has nothing to hold it in place, whereas the pancreas it's fixed and it will pull to it and it will produce an annular impression on the lateral wall. Incidentally, it's not part of this lecture, but this little line has been called Hampton's line. And, and this is a line that proves that this is a benign ulcer. If this were a malignant ulcer, this would not be a thin mucosal line, undermined edge of mucosa. This would be thick and nodular and be abnormal. Here's a cloverleaf deformity of the duodenal bulb in three patients. The cloverleaf deformity in the bulb is not obstructive because there's so much volume, but when an ulcer in the duodenal bulb scars down, it will contract and produce deformity that looks like, fancifully, a clover leaf. Because there's so much volume, the patient will not have, usually does not have obstructive GI symptoms. Here is a patient who has the gift of not one, but two, two pyloruses. This is the true and real pylorus, 
but on the lesser curvature of the duodenal bulb and the lesser curvature of the adjacent stomach, there can be a tract that goes through. This is known now uh, to be not congenital, which it once th was thought to be, but this is a fistula that forms from an ulcer in the antrum of the stomach and penetrates into and fistularizes to the duodenal bulb. Once it fistularizes, peristalsis will keep it open and it will never heal. It will be resurfaced with mucosa and it will look to the endoscopist as if there are uh, two, two pyloruses. The mucosa will look normal to view, but we now know it's not congenital. This is a result of a duodenal bulb. Another one. Now, there are other things that will do this. Uh, one of them is tumor. Another is Crohn's disease. So you have to look at the background mucosa and the history of the patient. If the patient is asymptomatic, it probably is a benign double pylorus or a benign chronic post-ulcer fistula to the duodenum. Peptic ulcer, once it's formed, is forever. Crohn's, cancer, lymphoma, and METS, less likely. Another abnormality that can occur is um, a gallstone ileus, which is a permanent fistula of the duodenum to the gallbladder. Once a cholecystitis occurs and the gallstone erodes into the duodenum, and if it's a small gallstone, it'll pass. It could even pass asymptomatically. If it's big, it may cause gallstone ileus. Once this occurs, this tends to stay forever. Also because peristalsis will keep it open. So the contraction of the bulb will keep this little contraction open. This is the full gallbladder body straddling over the du duodenum, and this is the cystic duct. Another patient with a fistula, and this is a gallstone that couldn't make it through the fistula, but it may make it someday if there's um, any uh, inflammation that occurs in the residual gallbladder. Patient with gallstone ileus, a permanent fistula from the duodenum to the descending limb of the duodenum. It may occur at the bulb, descending limb, or it can also fistularize into the stomach. Now, I'm going to leave that for a while because I'll come back to it later, but I want to talk to you about Crohn's disease while I'm at it, another cause for strictures and fistularization. And Crohn's disease may present just with fold thickening in the duodenum, or it may present with strictures or fistulars to the colon another patient with Crohn's disease, and we can see some classic features of Crohn's disease when the duodenum is affected. One of them is a narrowing of the antrum, widening of the pylorus, and then narrowing of the duodenal bulb, creating a sort of um, hourglass configuration, an hourglass configuration. Now, notice here that there is Crohn's disease on one wall, and this is Crohn's disease nodularity, and this is nodular fold thickening adjacent to it, pulling it in. Crohn's disease giving you the NBC sign and also giving you the tapered antrum, widened pylorus, and narrow duodenal bulb. And there's a mural also there. Another patient with Crohn's disease showing, again, narrowing of the antrum, widening of the pylorus, which tends to stay open during the entire examination, and then there may be features in the duodenal bulb that give you a clue. This is longitudinal and transverse ulcers giving cobblestoning in the duodenal bulb. Crohn's disease, descending limb of the duodenum, and these are all strictures, pseudosacculations, and involvement with Crohn's disease in the entire duodenum. Notice also that the stomach is big because Crohn's disease, when it is widespread in the duodenum, will cause chronic obstruction and may require surgery. This patient has pain, nausea, vomiting, and there is an abnormality in the, in the, um, in the post bulbar duodenum. So this is a dilated bulb and there is a narrowing here. And this is going to be a differential. I don't know whether this is an apple core lesion 
I don't know whether this is an ulcer. I don't know whether this is a manifestation of Crohn's disease. But we have to take the whole history in, in, um, in account. And this is cancer of the uh, pancreas invading the duodenum and causing narrowing. Cancer of the pancreas can invade the duodenum and case the common bile duct and be puzzling uh, just with water soluble material. There's no one test that should be depended on. Sometimes CT, sometimes barium. The clinical situation will give you an indication of what test is best. We know that polyps occur anywhere in the alimentary tract. We know they occur in the esophagus, um, stomach, duodenum, etc. And here is a polypoid, multilobulated, benign adenoma. And this is a carcinoma of the duodenum with a classic apple core. Don't be puzzled by this. If you see something strange in the duodenum, transfer it mentally to another organ. You would not hesitate in calling this an apple core carcinoma of the, of the colon. This is an apple core carcinoma of the duodenum and a polyp of the duodenum. Carcinoma, another apple core lesion, just similar to this, but now even tighter. Apple core carcinoma. Now, this is a patient whose film speaks for itself and limits the differential. You'll notice that there is a polypoid filling defect in the distal common bile duct. Now, that could be a polypoid adenoma. It could be a, an impacted stone. But this patient has a stoma. And patients have stomas for colostomy, uh, for colon resections, permanent ileostomies, temporary stomas. But this plus this want me to think colectomy. And one of the causes for doing a colectomy is uh, for familial adenomatous polyposis, also ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or a toxic megacolon may require a total colectomy. So the clue is the stoma. This is an FAP tumor. Here's another patient with familial adenomatous polyposis, and there's a big, ugly duodenal adenocarcinoma. Familial polyposis loves the duodenum. Another patient with uh, films speaking for themselves. This is a different patient, again with a polyp in the distal common bile duct, and no colon. These two films should be shouting at you, I am... Um, I am familial polyposis, and this is a benign or malignant polyp. Um, patients with familial polyposis and colectomies require a lifetime of follow-up on the duodenum. They're supposed to have their duodenum evaluated, if not yearly, every other year by one method or another. Another patient, no colon at all. Look at the splenic flexure. There is no colon. Now, that tells you you have a differential, and this is a large polypoid carcinoma of the descending limb postbulbar region of the duodenum. Another patient with familial polyposis, 33 years post-colectomy. These patients are at lifetime risk of carcinoma of the small bowel or of the duodenum. And this was carcinoma of the small bowel in a patient with familial polyposis. The relative risk of an upper GI cancer in familial polyposis is super dramatic. The duodenum is 331 times more likely to have a carcinoma develop in it than in the general population. The ampulla, if separated out, is 124 times. Gastric 2.4 and non-duodenal small bowel um, cancer is also dramatically elevated, 12-fold over the general population. This is something that I want to show you from history, and this is how we would make the diagnosis of cancer of the pancreas before there was anything except uh, dacrum and films and fluoroscopy. We would see nodularity in the descending limb of the duodenum touching the pancreas, and we call this the reverse three sign of Frostberg. 
And this could be a cancer of the duodenum in that region, the biliary tree in that region, or the pancreas. Statistically, more commonly, it was pancreatic carcinoma. And we boldly, boldly made that diagnosis before the era of any imaging and any endoscopy. And this patient would go on assay with barium to the operating room for exploration. Cancer of the pancreas tends to involve the duodenum eccentrically along the region where the pancreatic um, pancreas intersects the, uh, the wall of the duodenum going around. So it can go from the post-bulbar region all the way down to the ligament of trites. And this is another patient with a very unique abnormality in the duodenum. If you look carefully, you'll see that the descending limb of the duodenum is quite funky. In here, there is soft tissue, which is coming down from the stomach, down, 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 way down the descending limb of the duodenum. What the heck could this be? This represents a, a, a unique type of non-tumor. This is another patient with the same abnormality. A polypoid. This is, this is food debris. This is not tumor. But look here. You can see that it comes all the way down from the stomach. So we have a stomach tumor in the duodenum. And at endoscopy, the base attachment is way up in the stomach. And the polypoid lesion is in the mid or lower or somewhere in the duodenum. And this is called a fibrovascular polyp. It's a non-neoplastic polyp that has submucosal origin. Another way to think of it, it's a peristaltic cycle tumor. The bump gets pulled, squeezed, bleed, fibrose. Repeat this cycle endlessly and the polypoid lesion will get larger and larger and larger and it will be filled with fibrous tissue and ectatic vessels that are squeezed and enlarged by peristalsis. It's benign. This occurs throughout the GI tract, but usually is small. It tends to become big uh, in regions where there is a very strong muscle. Think cricopharyngeus between the pharynx and the, and the esophagus. Think the pylorus, which we're looking at, Think of the ileocecal valve and think of the anus, which will produce fibrosed giant hemorrhoids. They can also occur anywhere, but usually they don't get big and gigantic and astounding unless they're near a big muscle. But there is one little thing to worry about in these patients. Any polypoid lesion can be grabbed, and if someone has a polypoid uh, sessile adenoma, it may be pulled through. If someone has a sessile cancer, it may be pulled through that strong muscle and present in the duodenum. I have only seen one case like this in 40 years. And this was a cancer of the stomach into susceptible into the duodenum. This was removed at surgery, thinking it was benign. And lo and behold, a few days later, uh, they found inside a big bulky tumor, malignancy. So this probably started as a cancer, and then the, there was scarring from peristalsis. Two patients, different, uh, different patients, but you need a differential for this, but notice that it's soft, it's smooth, it's round, and it's deformed. This one turns from a round into a long, elongated structure, and this one is round and then develops a peristaltic contraction in its middle. There are only a couple of things that will do that. These are two lipomas, but in the differential is a submucosal duplication cyst. Um, and that's about all. Something soft, something soft will deform. A gist will not. Any mesenchymal tumor in the wall will not deform because they're hard. Lipoma is the only one that is soft, and the differential is a duplication cyst. Lymphoma can occur in the duodenum and look multinodular. And this is a patient with lymphoma of the duodenum and some scattered nodules in the remainder of the small bowel. 
Now, one secret of lymphoma is that it tends to be pleomorphic nodularity, not like Brunner's gland, which is all relatively monotonous, or not like um, uh, heterotopic mucosa in the bulb, which are all polygons and relatively tiny. So you can have not sand and little stones, you can have a gravel pit with big polyps and small polyps and because each one of these is an independent malignancy that will grow at its own rate, lymphoma of the duodenum. And that concept holds true for lymphoma in any organ. They all are independent entities. They're like franchisees of the major disease process. A classic term that you'll hear with barium and you may see it on CT, is a stack of coins. And this represents, in this case, blood in the bowel related to trauma, anticoagulation, vasculitis, ischemia, or venous occlusion. It was a nonspecific finding, but it would often set us in motion. And it's still mentioned, used, and shown with barium and with CT and with MR. Nonspecific finding can also be fluid and edema, as in angioedema on a CT. This is a classic hematoma, a stack of coins, and this represents blood in the fold. And this is a classic location for a hematoma to form. And that's between the spine and the anterior abdominal wall, somewhere in the midline. So he, duodenal hematomas would occur all the way from the postbulbar region all the way down to the ligament, near the ligament of trites. And they could rep be seen as a stack of coins if it's not a bad process, a bad hematoma. Or if there's a big hematoma, it will give you the coil spring appearance, a nonspecific turn which can also be seen in patients with intussusceptions. The coil spring represents a mass that is pushing the contents against uh, the wall. So you have two mucosal surfaces being pushed together and barium trapped in the wall. Can also be seen in patients who have intussusceptions and contrast gets into the lumen. Here are two duodenal hematomas in the proximal duodenum, big polypoid mass. Um, and it's expanding the duodenum. And if this were a tumor, this patient would have been vomiting for months. So this is a sudden onset process that is expanding the duodenum. A gigantic thing without prior history except trauma, this is a hematoma, two different forms. Hematomas uh, occur in the duodenal sweep, which is easily injured. It's fixed in the retroperitoneum. And here is a large duodenal hematoma. And the, the, blood, the force of trauma can go anywhere, side, from the side, from the front, uh, the duodenum is fixed. It can't get out of the way. The spine is rigid, small bowel, large bowel, stomach, are mobile, but the poor duodenum stays in place. Another patient with a hematoma. When you make the diagnosis by CT or with a barium examination, you have to watch and wait and tell the surgeons to stay away. You're certain it's a hematoma. Parenteral feedings, then liquids, but if you operate, it's going to be a bloody mess because the hematomas, when they're new, are going to be all bleedy and bloody and they'll require major resections. Leave them alone. Here's a patient, June 16th, showing the natural history of a hematoma. It's big. And there's non-homogeneity in it, and that represents recent blood that is coagulating and filling the wall and the lumen, filling the lumen. But June 22nd, it is bigger. And that's the natural history. It doesn't mean it's still bleeding. It just means that there is hypertonic fluid, uh, hypertonic fluid uh, hematoma, and it may be sucking some blood in, and there may be a little bit of oozing too, but it's not going to give you uh, 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 hemodynamic significance. This patient is asymptomatic, except they want to eat. They're not allowed to eat yet. June 26, it's even bigger. And yet the patient is asymptomatic except for, I want to eat, I want to eat. They're watching them carefully. And then September 30, it begins to recede. And that's the natural history. And now this patient can drink and there's contrast material passing readily through. They vary by the age of the hematoma. Increase as it matures and shrink at the end. Day 14, it's almost gone. This is a patient with a rare 
abnormality, and these are serpiginous and nodular folds in the duodenal wall. We used to see these in patients with big spleens and yellow skins. Uh, these patients may have varices just in the duodenum or just in the fundus, uh, and so these are varices of the duodenum. And these can be overlooked. We used to overlook them almost in patients with esophageal varices. Changeable fold exaggeration, fleeting polyps, and they may be associated with cavernous transformation and with hepatopetal flow. This is cavernous transformation, and you can see that it is compressing and distorting the descending limb of the duodenum in here, and there are vessels crossing around it. Varices. Four patients, same diagnosis, duodenitis, but why? Four patients, duodenitis. And we used to see this very commonly, and it would help us in diagnosing an abnormality, which is frequent. This is celiac disease or celiac sprue, and that tended to have a bald and foamy duodenum because the disease would hit the duodenum first. It would be atrophic duodenitis, thick folds, fold loss, nodular mucosa, strictures in the duodenum and the proximal small bowel. Because these patients had thin mucosa, they had decreased resistance to normal gastric acid, and they tended to get duodenitis. This is two more patients with celiac sprue. Notice the nodularity of the duodenum and the baldness. There are no folds in here. These are all submucosal glands that are inflamed and nodular. Celiac duodenitis, more patients. And um, we'll leave that now. And this is a patient who has a question mark for you. And this patient has nausea and uh, may have weight loss, may have vomiting. And the duodenum is dilated to this point, and then there's a tubular filling defect. A sharp cutoff is seen, and this represents the pa a patient who has um, superior mesenteric artery syndrome. Superior mesenteric artery syndrome can occur in patients who have uh, disease in the pancreas, disease uh, in the weight loss, they're put in a cast and they are laying on their back, or they're given medication which will weaken peristalsis. If you weaken peristalsis in a thin patient, this may become evident and they may have some nausea and vomiting and compression. Another patient with SMA syndrome, and you can see calcification, this is pancreatitis. Another patient with a gigantic duodenum with a notch where the, the aorta is pressing against it. And this is a superior mesenteric artery syndrome because the SMA is trapped between a gigantic aneurysm. Here's the aneurysm, and the duodenum has to leap over it to get into the ligament of trites. It's a very, very thin place. Patients with weight loss, sudden dramatic weight loss, will have decrease in the angle of the superior mesenteric artery. This is the duodenum trying to squeeze its way through. The SMA syndrome, normal uptight ligament of trites, SMA in front, and there's a relative ileus, post-op immobilization, weight loss, aortic disease, SMA, adenopathy, scleroderma, anything that will weaken peristalsis or create a mass effect. What other syndrome may be associated? Pelvic congestion syndrome, because these patients may have compression of their renal vein as it crosses from the left all the way across the aorta. That also will be a narrow space. Another patient, another patient. Now this one tells a different story. This one is a patient who has a little bit of impression here, but look at the old days we would have pacify the gallbladder on almost every patient. And this one is pressing against the duodenal bulb and deforming it. And that tells you only that it's a tight space. Can you imagine a little cholecystitis, what it would do to the duodenum there? And that's why you get things like this, duodenitis, uh, cholecystoduodenal fistulas. Uh, there's another possibility. It may not go into the duodenum. It may go into the stomach. And this is a patient with a gallstone in the duodenum. 
uh, the adrenal bulb, it is, but there's also a gallstone that has regurgitated or fistularized into the stomach, producing Bouveret syndrome. These patients are known to have neon yellow vomitus because it's pure bile. It's not succus entericus. It's not green. It's pure yellow neon vomitus. And that occurs, Bouveret occurs when it's wedged in the duodenum and can't go down, or it's in the stomach, wedged in the antrum, and the patient will not be able to um, uh, empty their stomach and vomit. So we've seen these before. So the, the duodenum lives in a very, very, very tight neighborhood, and there are a lot of diseases of other organs that we used to see. You will still encounter them. Knowledge of the pathophysiology from barium translated into CT will make you a better CT reader and give you suspicion and understanding of what can happen in this very, very tight neighborhood. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed that classic run through the duodenum. Don't be afraid on, on any test. I think this is going to include 99% of what might be asked ever in the duodenum. Thank you very much.